I'm excited about this one, ladies and gents. I'm excited about the idea of Frankie de Jong joining Manchester United. I, I, I kind of still feel like it might be a pipe dream. But who better to speak to about whether or not he could leave Barcelona and to speak about Barcelona's financial situation more importantly, I suppose. And that's Graham Hunter. Thank you very much for joining me today, Graham. How are you doing, mate? Sam morning. Happy to be with you. Lovely Sunday morning out in Spain. You enjoying the sunshine by the looks of it? It's absolutely beautiful. It's the penultimate day of La Liga. Commentary job on later on this afternoon. I'm looking forward to it, but for the moment, you've got my full attention. Well, that's uh, very much obliged. And I, 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 we'll, we'll dive straight into it. And what I, what, what I will say is that I'll make sure I leave you a link in the description, by the way, ladies and gents. If you're not aware of it, I'm sure you are by now. You can't not be aware of the big interviews that Graham Hunter does. is also on YouTube, too. I'm going to leave a link in the description. Go over there. There's a cracking one on Yap Stam, which I listened to over the weekend. Yap Stam. I mean, it doesn't look like he's coming back to Manchester United to work with Eric Ten Hag, but he's playing the Legends game, so I'll see how that gets on. But let's focus on, on Frankie de Jong and Barcelona. It's been, I suppose it's fair to say, a little bit up and down for Frankie de Jong at Barcelona since he joined from Ajax. Um, he only, he's only completed 13 out of 33 games under Xavi. He starts most of the games, but he doesn't really finish them. You know, what, what do you know about how Barcelona feel about Frankie de Jong? Do you think it the, the, does the board and the fans, do they all feel like it's been a success for him? Or is it sort of like 50-50? No, look, <clears throat> you wouldn't appreciate me if I said, um, how do Manchester United feel about something? Because you know that your club has rarely been as divided into different camps as it is now. And that goes for Barcelona, Sam. So, you, you've asked about six, seven different questions there. There are parts of the fan base that appreciate that this is a player of, of vision, of talent. Um, there are parts of the fan base who have seen other footballers come to camp now and, and take a long time to come to terms with the pressure. And also, it's not just generic pressure, it's a pressure to play in a particular manner. It's, it's now as big a pressure as probably been on the club ever. Um, there have been other terrible moments <clears throat> in their history, but one that combines dominant Madrid, massive debt, um, a lack of trophies, the departure of Leo Messi, all at the same time. Think about that perfect storm in football terms. So that if you divide the fan base up, there are certainly some who, who think he's not right for the club. There are some who are willing to show patience. And there are some who appreciate the fact that he's simply that he's gifted. But then if you... Joan Laporta is a very different... That's the president of Barcelona. He's a very different Catalan, a very different man from Xavi Hernandez, the coach. And my understanding of it is that Joan Laporta, if he got the right money in, would, would sell instantly. And one of the reasons that as stories have emerged about... Manchester United and, and latterly Manchester City being interested in Frankie de Jong. One of the reasons you've seen Xavi Hernandez going out to bat for him is that he, he's batting on a sticky wicket. Um, at 25, I think he is, um, patently gifted and established Netherlands international. Frankie de Jong has, still has the makings of an important player in the right squad. He's a, a target clearly because you know clubs who are hawkish like to pick off undervalued talent at other clubs where the financial situation renders them powerless. So in, in some aspects, Frankie de Jong becomes um, a very obvious target for either an aspiring club like Manchester United, and, and we have to count it as aspirations about getting back into the Champions League, getting back into competing for trophies, and there's an aspiration that Ten Hag is, is the correct coach for this you know, pretty awful situation. I would argue, knowing what I know, is, is worse behind the scenes than it is on the pitch. And, and I think that's saying something. So when you ask about the opinion on uh, Frankie de Jong, it, it, it's polarised in some cases. It's certainly divided. And, and Xavi Hernandez speaks well about him because, if you remember correctly, and, and age might be a thing for you here, when Xavi was coming through first at Football Club Barcelona, he was a tyro. I mean, he was massively well regarded. But by the time that Frank Rijkaard took over, Barcelona were in the middle of a six-year trophyless slump. Frank Rijkaard changed his position, and Xavi has been very honest about this subsequently. So say, I went, he went to the coach and said, "I can't handle this. I'm not going to be good enough for it." And Rijkaard said to him, 
in so many words. Wise up. I believe in you. You're doing it. And he became the dominant midfielder in a Barcelona era, a dominant midfielder in the world. And I think, from, from my taste, um, the greatest footballer that Spain has ever had. And therefore, my point being that as Frankie Young struggles, I can fully understand Xavi saying to him, like, have faith in me. I will teach you. I will show you the way. And it's patent on and off the record that Xavi Hernandez would prefer to keep Frankie de Jong. But the, the discussion doesn't end there, Sam. I, I th- you touched on it earlier, and I think this is a really important point because you spoke about it, Joana Borte and how the president of Barcelona is very, very different to Xavi Hernandez uh, in terms of how he thinks. Now, fin- the financially, Barcelona are in a, a difficult situation, I think it's fair to say, right? Is it the political situation of the fact that he could he could sell Frankie de Jong but probably couldn't sell someone like, you know, Pedri. Or, there's certain players who are unsellable, right? And if, if Barcelona are going to sign players, this summer, if you could give me a little bit of insight into this as well, uh, is, is the Barcelona budget currently, um, is it like minus 144 million that was set by La Liga? So they need to sell players in order to buy players. Is that correct? Yeah, it's in flux all the time. And um, what people will understand, first of all, is the headline sum, which is the global debt of 1.4 billion. Now, what Barcelona have been doing is taking loans, selling off parts of their um, club structure so that their income is going up. They can now bet against future income, given that they qualify for the Champions League. Should they finish second, they can bet against future income because it's a guaranteed eight million for taking part in the Spanish Super Cup. So there are some minor positives. What you're aiming at there and what you're talking about there is the financial fair play situation imposed by La Liga. And yeah, Barcelona are in a, in a deep negative there because some of the um, money that they have been generating doesn't count at levelling the balance of financial fair play. One of the absolute key things that they have to do is bring in transfer fees where the trading is positive for financial fair play based on money they've generated from a footballer, but also one of the massive things that they still have to do, despite, again, I'm, I will use the word because it's accurate, despite making massive progress in reducing what was, I think, the biggest, certainly was the biggest football salary anywhere in the world when Joanne Laporta took over, which is just before Easter, late spring last year. So... Let's say, let's, and we still have to talk about the, the, the realism of this idea. Mm. Let's say somebody were willing to offer 50 million euros for Frankie de Jong. For my taste, that's a really good deal for Football Club Barcelona. But in the media, no doubt briefed by the club, the, the Catalan media, everybody's talking about getting their money back, 70 plus million euros. Well, any intelligent football club isn't going to pay that, as far as I'm concerned. Frankie de Jong is in a state of flux. He definitely hasn't developed as a footballer since he joined from Ajax. There's a, there's a really clear attractiveness um, of, for Manchester United, from Manchester United's attention to him, which is that um, being reunited with an important coach, from potentially, and I only say potentially, being reunited with Van der Beek, who, who played... When De Jong was at his most powerful for Ajax, they played 4-2-3-1, and Van der Beek was predominantly a guy next to Frankie De Jong. And Frankie De Jong hasn't mastered what what Xavi refers to, what Pep Guardiola refers to as positional football. He literally hasn't mastered it. He wasn't taught in it, and Xavi's perception when he came into the club last November was, well, the academy players and the Dutch players will instantly be able to understand what I demand of them in terms of positional football. And and Xavi has been gobsmacked that so few of the Dutch players, so few of the academy players understand it fully and can execute it fully. And therefore, when, if you start to assess the price, anybody coming in will say, like, Bustling are in a weak position. De Jong, Frankie De Jong is, is clearly hacked off about he's doing what he thinks is right. He's He's not to my taste. You haven't asked this, so excuse me poking my big nose in. He's not my taste as a footballer, Sam, in that he's perpetually um, 
first of all, he's perpetually seeking out other things to blame. Secondly, he's shown very little learning, ability to understand where he's going wrong since he joined Football Club Barcelona. And thirdly, what I, I, I literally can't understand is that having lived in this country and worked at Football Club Barcelona for, for 20 years, a player like Messi, a player like Iniesta, smaller um, than and De Jong, were able to maximise their brilliance by making sure that in terms of top body strength, they were absolutely as, as tough, as well prepared, as robust as they could be given the size of their frame. Frankie De Jong not only still looks like a, you know, an 18 year old kid physically, he's not, he's not done anything to address that. If you look at Iniesta from about his middle twenties onwards, he, he was in terms of what could be fitted into that small physique, physical package, he was a tank. Hmm. And he's excelled and he's still playing now in his late thirties in Japan, World Cup winner, Champions League winner, I think the only man to be a man of the match in the final of a World Cup and a Champions League and a European Championship. Frankie Dion would do well to take a side look and say, well, well, well I still got a copy that, that might help me there. And he hasn't. Now, maybe being re reunited with Ten Hag, maybe changing um, environment, maybe feeling that I'm the leader of a new era at Manchester United, maybe fitting into the disciplines under Pep Guardiola, because you, you have to accept that City are one of those clubs that are, are potentially bidding for him. Maybe that appeals to him, Sam, but all I'm saying is at the moment, this is a footballer in flux and part of the problem is his own. Uh, I think, well, you've, you've touched on it there. It's probably as to why um, he may be one of those players at Barcelona who could be sold. And I, th I think that's the question I'd like to ask you. Uh, hypothetically, uh, we, this, this may well not happen. It may well be the case that Franco de Jong stays. It's clear that Xavi does like him as a, as a player, but as you've touched on there, maybe there's still more growth that he needs to have. But if it's not going to be De Jong that gets sold to raise funds for Barcelona this summer, who else could realistically raise as much money for the club as De Jong? No, the, 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 there isn't another candidate that would be as um, that would be feasible to sell because you're right. I, I would argue that there's probably only three utterly untouchable footballers, and there are Pedri, Ansu Fati, and Gavi. There are others that, without doubt, the regime doesn't want to sell. One is, for example, Mark andre Ter Stegen. There would be two or three other that would come into the category of last resort. But those who are either about to be released or are tradable, the idea of getting the same salary reduction and the same transfer um, input um, financially, you're right that there isn't that possibility. And one of the things that you have to be clear about is that crown jewel players like um, Gavi and Pedri and Ansu in particular, you, once you start selling them, it's a fire sale and other players don't want to come. It's less likely that players, elite players will join the academy because they're like, well, there isn't a future pathway there for me. So I don't see any of those things happening. Um, I... I, I do think that gradually it can be the case that Barcelona can become a more attractive place to go to because Xavi has really clear coaching credentials. And when they play well, like scoring four at Napoli, like knocking out Galatasaray in Istanbul, like scoring four against Atleti at home, like scoring four against Athletic at home, like scoring four away to Madrid since he took over. Then football players like, for example, Lewandowski, who I think not only has, has said to Salah Medjic at, at Bayern Munich, I want to leave, he's told them that he wants to go to Barcelona. Now, it's down to Barcelona to put that package together. Yeah. Apologies, everybody, for evil can evil in the background. <laughs> but you, I know you were talking about sales, and I'm going to talk about um, what kind of pan panorama there can be at Football Club Barcelona. To, to be honest, the key property who's at the right age, carries the right skill profile, and would not only bring decent um, income, but would also lower our wage bill significantly. That man is Frankie de Jong. But every club, every good scouting department around Europe knows that. And therefore, unless two, three clubs, which I'm, I'm, I think is a little bit unlikely, come in and punch it out in a big bidding war so the price goes up, the chances are that 
people are going to approach to the same. It's a buyer's market. You know, we can wait throughout June. We can wait till July and see if Barcelona start to knock their knees together and go, okay, okay, we'll sell for 35. So I, I think it's a really complex, I think for any club that's committed to buying Frankie de Jong, and it's a club that Frankie de Jong would relish playing at, there's a real buyer's opportunity. Do you, do you think there's a situation that can develop this summer where Barcelona don't send anybody and, and they still get the amount and then Xavi gets the sort of players that he needs for this? Because this is his first full season, right? It's his first summer as a manager. He needs Correct. new players to be part of this new Barcelona that he's building. Is there any way that Barcelona can cope and buy people in that he needs without sending anybody? Is that actually possible? Um, it's an interesting question. And I think that in terms of the negotiations you're talking about, to be as powerful as they want to in a deal like the one you're talking about, say United coming in and buying Frankie de Jong, is pretty nearly um, unavoidable. But on your premise, I think they've already signed uh, Kessie from Milan to play in midfield. Yep. De Jong moving out can be a gap. I think they've already signed Christensen um, from Chelsea. And therefore, there's a minor feasibility that your hypothesis could work that there are nothing other than, um, say, out-of-contract players leaving, like Dembele, who they're desperately trying to keep, but he's out of contract. So he could leave, um, the salary bill would go down, it would be good for financial fair play, but as far as Xavi is concerned, it would be a terrible loss. Um, Luke de Jong is going back to Seville, he's only been on loan, and they are going to try to push um, Umtiti and Longley and Dest out if they can. But on your hypothesis, there could be minimal departures. There could be nothing other than natural wastage. And they could fail to land a big deal like the one we're talking about. And, and their, their ability to, to punch their weight in the transfer market would be drastically reduced. But they could make some movements. Yes, they could. Yes. If, if, if I could ask you one final question, then. We, we've spoken a lot in detail there about um, Barcelona's situation, the political situation... What about Frankie de Jong? You know, how happy is he in Barcelona? How happy has he been in Barcelona? And the, the, the thing for me uh, that we keep hearing and seeing is, is the idea that Frankie de Jong really wants to play Champions League football next year, which obviously United can't offer him. Uh, how important do you think that is to Frankie de Jong? Um, and as I said, yeah, how happy would he be to, to leave Barcelona? Is he always been like a happy player at the club or is it, is it something that he could easily move on to another club in that sense? It's another jigsaw answer, Sam. Um, he was signed by uh, the man, or he was signed under the reign of the man who was the first person he called when um, when Barcelona uh, wanted him. So when Bartomeu signed him, um, Bartomeu's idea was was to try and get Koeman. And albeit that um, when De Jong came in, it was ahead of Koeman. Dion put the phone up to Ronald Koeman and said, should I go? And Koeman's like, go, go immediately. He said, his best piece of advice, this is literally, he said, stay out of cake shops. He said, you can eat too much in Barcelona. And by the time that Koeman came and took over, Frankie Dion was a very content footballer because they were playing a brand of football he understood. He enjoyed the relationship with the coach, very much enjoyed the relationship with Koeman, who'd been his national team coach. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not a great... I'm in the amateur of social media, particularly. I don't have that Instagram pictorial stuff that they do. But people would share with me, Frankie de Jong, all around the, the city and the coasts of you know, this beautiful part of the Mediterranean with, um, I'm going to say his girlfriend rather than his wife, I think, happy as Larry, and, and stating that he loved the culture, that he loved the city, that he loved the temperatures. And there were times, particularly in winning the cup, um, you know, with the Titanic, semi-final tie against Seville um, and eventually winning the cup, I think, against the Athletic uh, Club. Yeah there, yeah, there have been definitely times when he's been happy. He would have been resentful that Koeman was dismissed uh, mid-season after that really pitiful defeat at Rayo Vallecano. And then you're at the heart of, of a seesaw debate in his own mind. And, and he's, he's very clear about this, that he, he feels that he should be a leader player. He feels that he should be perfect for this persona. But he's pretty continuously subbed off. Um, he's he's um, currently suspended for the penultimate game of La Liga. And 
he hasn't enjoyed the the Chavi revolution. I don't think that there are daggers drawn between the two men. But Chavi is a very demanding coach with a very specific football vocabulary. And you have to hit the targets. And one of the things that's happening between teacher and pupil is that Frankie de Jong keeps it's a really frustrating strict system and i don't know how much you've studied or your, your viewers have studied positional football but it's very geometric and it's very much the way that for example city play and um, across the city from you whereby it might to the neutral observer look as if everybody's just inventing what they do but the rules are so strict and you'll see pep guardiola i'm sorry to mention his name in this in this tough time for your club <laughs> Going absolutely crazy about minuscule, you know, half a foot positioning mistakes, half a meter positioning mistakes. Xavi's the same, maybe a little bit less gruff than Pep. And De Jong is frustrated that he's like, this is how I play. This is the Frankie De Jong that, that was bought. And he's resistant either consciously or subconsciously to learning. And so, for example, one of the things that Xavi picks on is that Frankie De Jong, which is not a bad habit in most footballers, when he's not involved enough in a match, he'll go looking for the ball. And Chavi's so like, no, if you come into certain areas, that's screwing up the way in which we like to play passing triangles, move the opposition about, and you need to be waiting in the area where I tell you that you need to be. I'll, it, there are indications about when you need to come and seek and create a, um, solve a problem when the opposition have got superiority in areas. That's fine. But when we're in the ball and you're not seeing enough of it, patience. And that's been hard for Frankie de Jong to... And, and listen, you'll be recognising that none of these descriptions of football are how Manchester United play right now. Yeah. So that's not a problem were he to join your club. And given how he thrived with Tanag and Van de Beek, again, future can be rosy. Champions League, of course, he's, he's a player that, that, that craves that. He, he properly came to the attention of the outside world. And he was a relative ingenue at Ajax. With those, you know, the, the massive win over Real Madrid after losing the first leg in the quarterfinal and then the win at, um, at Spurs in the semi-final, part of the team that then went out to Pochettino Spurs in, in the second leg, admittedly. But, you know, I, th I, think it's, I think it's crucial to understand that the debate in Frankie de Jong's head right now is Champions League football, should he stay? And the coach has been pretty loud about, I'm counting on him, I want him. But if the offer is right, and it means a season rebuilding at Manchester United and aiming for the Champions League, or still more worryingly for you, if it were the case that, that um, Pep Guardiola said, yeah, we're all in, we're all in on this player, then I think in the, in the case of City, I think he, he bites the hand off. Although positionally, he's got a far more, far tougher, far more gritty teacher than Guardiola and Xavi. But at United, I think the, I think the, if, if the money were right and Barcelona were to accept it, I think the temptation would be huge for him to say yes. I mean, I, I hope so. I, I, I personally think that if, if we're looking at this, I mean, Manchester United, as you probably know, we're, we're, we're another rebuild project. It must be like the fourth rebuild we've had in seven years. But uh, for the Ten Hag system to work, a player like De Jong that can be that deeper line playmaker is crucial in the build-up play. The, 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 the one thing I'd say, I, I'm not being argumentative here, but I don't think there's one single Ten Hag system. If you look at this season, yeah. then predominantly, I think it's about 45, 50%, 43-1. But he's quite happy playing 4-3-3. Now, again, with your point, De Jong has played in both of those systems. And I would add, although it's, I'm certain it's not mentioning it, it's mine. He, he actually did quite well playing as the right centre back in a three in a in a wing back system. So he did he did very um, clearly play regularly for Kuman as part of a back three. Now I wouldn't imagine a club like United um, would be initially under Ten Hag would be initially thinking about playing three at the back regularly, but as an option, it's another string to his bow that clubs will think well in certain circumstances or in a game where we need to go five at the back. He can do it. So, all I would say about, you know, for as much as I've studied Ten Hag, when he talks about, he talks about flexibility, he talks about his team's bamboozling and, and, and confusing opponents. So that's a high work rate. It's about positional flexibility and it's about being able to go past opponents. Now, I, and, and, and also Ten Hag talks a lot about a central part 
of how he wants to lift trophies is, is entertaining the fans, that he wants it to be an experience. Ten Hag has a lot of those things. But I swear to you, if in several months we're talking about Frankie de Jong, Manchester United player, you'll be looking at, has he got the, the physique um, to be to be holding off the still more robust challenges in the Premier League compared to here? And secondly, there, there have been times when things have gone against Barcelona. And there have been times this season when Barcelona have been outright poor. I mean, outright poor. Where he's kind of looking around for solutions. So, um, if he, if he goes to United, I'll, I'll be watching hawkishly to see how much he's learned, to see how much the... the because in life, you, we often assimilate and we need a change or a break in order to prove what we've learned. It doesn't flow. I've been learning, I've been learning, I'm learning, and day three, bang, I'm applying it. Not everybody does that in life, never mind in football. So if he goes, it will fascinate me to see how he copes. Well, honestly, I really, really appreciate your time this morning because uh, this sort of insight, both into the, the, the situation at Barcelona to understand the finances, but as you've just given there, some real insight into the, the psychology of Frankie de Jong as a Barcelona player, the struggles he's had and the struggles that he would have at Manchester United if he did come. But, Graham, really appreciate your time today, man. Uh, good luck uh, this afternoon. Uh, who is it you're commentating on? Yeah, it's called uh, a multi. So, of the, I think, six or seven um, key games... We're doing a world feed so that we're flipping between every single game that's live as there is a good action or something controversial or a goal. So we'll be juggling, I don't know, whatever, how many players are on a pitch of seven games. I can't do my wrestling tip, but we will be juggling 140 players in our heads this afternoon, even before subs come on. So, wow, well, well be... good luck to you, my friend. As I said, yeah, maybe yeah. I can hopefully speak to you in the future, maybe in a few months' time after Frankie Diong has joined Manchester United potentially. But if not, I really appreciate your time. I, said. I, think, I think I said appreciate about six times now. Let's do it, Sam. I'll be happy to help again. Right, take it easy, Graham. Nice to talk to you, man. Cheers, Cheers man.